<laughs> well, well, well. Bet you didn't expect to see me again so soon. Oh. The reception of my first video was actually so good that it inspired me to start this one pretty much right away. Seriously, I think like three days went by after uploading it before I started recording for this review. It just got away from me for a couple of weeks. So here we are. Today we're going to be looking at fear. Now, I don't know if it's just me or if other people have experienced this too, but this has always been one of those games that I would hear about or read about, but I had never actually played. Until now, anyway. Fear is a horror-themed first-person shooter developed by Monolith and published by Sierra Entertainment. There's lots I have to talk about, so let's just jump right in. Oh, and you'll have to forgive me if the footage looks slightly bad in full screen. I'm playing in 1600 by 900 resolution because if I play it in 1080, the HUD and subtitles appear to be sized for ants. Which is actually a problem I run into a lot playing PC games decades after the fact, but we don't need to get into that right now. Fear stands for First Encounter Assault Recon. The acronym feels a little bit forced, but FEAR is a branch of the military that specializes in combating paranormal threats, and it was founded in 2002, right after 9-11. So our response to the worst terrorist attack on American soil ever was to recreate Sci-Fi Channel's Ghost Hunters, but we have guns now. In my experience, guns don't really work on ghosts, unless it's like the plasma beams from Ghostbusters or something. So, I guess we're all learning things in this video. To start off, we get an ominous cutscene that sets up the villain of the game. He escapes and eats some people, not a big deal, then he screams and these soldiers here stand at attention. This cutscene is really well done. The camera work and animation on the soldiers reminds me of something out of Metal Gear Solid, which is a good thing. Our boss, whose name is Betters, gives us the skinny on the situation. The cannibal is named Paxton Fettel, and he's actually some sort of telepathic commander who can command soldiers with just his mind. He was the result of a project by Armacam, a private military corporation from what I can gather, but they goofed it and now fear is being sent in to contain the situation. So here we are in a back alley. Looks like a dump, must be Philly. The first thing I notice about the game is the physics. They are really good for 2006, and honestly, I thought this game was on the Source Engine for a good hour or so when I first played it. Everyone knows that Source Engine was the gold standard for physics interactions in the early to mid-2000s, but this managed to fool me. Makes sense though, since this game's engine uses Havoc for its physics, and Valve's Source Engine physics system is derived from Havoc as well. What is this? Health booster? Yeah, you can find health boosters to boost your maximum health. A little bit of exploration, huh, Fair? Well, the game knows how to rope me in. I'm gonna be scavenging every inch of these levels to find these health upgrades. It's honestly a problem sometimes, but it's just how I am when games encourage exploration. I wanna find all the stuff! Dude, take a look around. Shut the hell up, Jankowski. I'm looking for health boosters. Ew, it's a dead guy. He looks messed up too. Maybe our cannibal friend is nearby. Nice! Look at this view! Too bad the sides of the roof are slightly too high for us to get a good look at the horizon. This must be what it's like to be short. I wouldn't know being six foot two, but eh. This looks good though. We have some nice late afternoon light, looks like right after the sun has gone down. I think the photographers call this the golden hour, and I can see why, cause damn. Kinda reminds me of my face. Oh yeah, definitely a broken nose at least. We're looking at possibly millions of taxpayer dollars in funding for fear, and we can't even train to be prepared for a chair to the mouth. I bet they let Pax and Fettel watch WWE Raw in his cell, and that's why he decided to knock me on my ass with a chair, instead of just cutting my carotid like a real man. After we come to, he tells us that the dead guy's name was Charles Heberger. The dead man's name was Charles Heberger. Oh, I see. He probably heard his name was Heberger and got it confused with Hamburger, so he ate him. Easy mistake to make, can't really fault him there. He says more completely sane and normal things, and we get some visions of a hospital or something, and we give chase. Also, I can't stop thinking about how much this slow motion baby's cry sounds like a vintage fire truck siren. This is when we get introduced to Delta Team, which plays a very every character other than Arnold Schwarzenegger in Predator role in this game, in that they're only here to get hacked up to bolster the image of the bad guys. They don't get skinned and hung though, so if you were hoping for some skinning and hanging, you'll just have to look elsewhere. Oh, whatever, dude. I'll let you know if I find any boots back there that need licking. Oh no, how tragic. Holy shit, she skeletonized them too. I can't compete with this. I mean, I could probably skeletonize someone with my gun, given enough time and enough bullets. 
but that would take more time and effort than I care to put into it right now. So for now, let's talk about our first enemies. They're your basic soldier class, but what many younger gamers might not notice immediately is that this AI is actually really good for its time. They flank you, rush you, flush you out with grenades. This is pretty commonplace in FPS games now, but this advanced AI was something you didn't really see that much of in the mid-2000s. And it really helps complement the level design. I'll talk more about that later, but right now I have my first complaint. It's nothing huge, it's more of an annoyance than anything else, but the goddamn flashlight, man. The flashlight sucks in this game. They do that annoying thing you see sometimes in games where your flashlight drains over time and has to recharge. Why? All this means is that I'm gonna have to literally stop and wait every so often in dark areas for my flashlight to recharge. It adds nothing interesting to the gameplay. Well, at least they didn't tie it to your sprinting. But yeah, the flashlight sucks. There's no, no way around it. Oh yeah, the slow motion. How did I forget about that? The slow motion is like the main thing. Yeah, this game lets you enter slow motion mode with the press of a button, given that your little reflex bar down here in the bottom isn't empty. It's super cool, and it looks fantastic. You could tell a lot of hours were spent making sure that every single thing in the environment looks great when it gets shot. This attention to detail goes a long way towards preserving the game, in my opinion. And that's just how it looks. In terms of gameplay, if you don't use the slow motion, this game can be very dangerous. To have John Woo movie mode available at the press of a button makes it really satisfying to blow away enemies in glorious bullet time. Even more so when you know they can wreck you if you're not careful. Oh yeah, I, I kind of forgot this game was trying to be scary at this point. You tend to be less afraid when you have an automatic weapon and are the Flash. Now, there are three main reasons why this game isn't scary. To me, anyways. The Matrix-inspired gameplay is actually not one of them. The first of the three reasons is that fear is just not that subtle. I mean, sure, in the developer commentary they talk about how they were trying to create a horror experience that tries to get under your skin instead of one that jumps out at you. But if that's the case, then why are there fade-to-white flashback sequences that teleport me to some room every 15 minutes? Why are there very obvious hallucinated characters that appear and disappear right in front of my eyes, complete with corny sound effects? Here's a good one. Why does the little girl in red attack me with explosions that knock me around like I'm a stunt actor attached to invisible wires? Oh yeah, nothing scarier than a fiery explosion. I mean, I'm scared of explosions in real life because dismemberment is horrifying, but in a video game? I probably look at video game explosions every day, and I don't think I've ever been scared by one. So yeah, that's reason number one on why I don't think this game is scary. Shit. I thought that was water. Hey, you guys want to see something kind of funny? Check this shit out. They have corded phones in this game, and they are all over the place. When I first saw this, I thought it was mildly entertaining as an artifact of this game being made in 2005. It only got funny to me when I learned that this game takes place in 2025. I can't really be mad at the devs for that though, since technology has been kind of exploding in the last couple of decades, but still, it gave me a good laugh. The phones aren't just for scenery, though. The game encourages you to listen to the voicemails on the phones that have them, and it's one of their main methods of exposition. The other method that they use is laptops that you can hack information out of, which gets some dialogue out of our Radio Man betters, but it's still kind of lame and not very engaging. I'll tell you what is engaging, though, and that's the level design. Around here, it starts to get really good. There's a bunch of side paths for flanking and lots of sections where if you loop back around but on a different path, you find yourself some extra supplies. Despite having some branching paths and open-ended hallway levels, I never get lost or find myself not knowing where to go. And that's how you know a level designer really knows what they're doing. Speaking of extra supplies, this game throws a lot of health packs your way. I find myself topping off my health with one health pack just so that I can pick up another one nearly every time I come across them. It also gives you way too much ammo, but I think that's mostly due to the fact that they want to give you lots of opportunities to switch your weapons out for different ones, since you can only carry three different weapons at a time. Did you know that the developers of this game have been quoted saying that the Matrix was a huge influence on them throughout the course of designing this game? I had no idea. So when I heard that, I knew I had to watch the movie again before I made this video, for research purposes. The last time I saw The Matrix all the way through, I was probably about 9 or 10 years old. Not old enough to understand the plot or the themes, I just thought it was a cool action movie. Well, now that I'm in my 20s, I can tell you that it is in fact a cool action movie, 
And it's also an evocative commentary on the metaphysical nature of the mind and the existential aspects of free will. Suffice to say, it's aged extremely well. I encourage any fellow Zoomers that haven't seen the original Matrix as an adult to go back and watch it. It's great. Anyways, Fear just borrows from the action shooty stuff, not from the Matrix's narrative. That's why we're listening to voicemails and radio transmissions to get all of our story. And if that's not enough bad news, it's at this point where the game's pacing is getting very predictable. Like, really, really predictable, actually. We have fun shooty segments with great action-packed combat encounters, but then they turn the game's tone on a dime, and we're back to roadside Halloween attraction mode. They play some sounds, you see a couple visions, but this wrecks the pacing of the game for me, which leads me into the second reason fear isn't scary. Little girls in red dresses just aren't scary anymore. The thing is though, I can almost guarantee that if I was playing this in 2005 or 2006, it would be much scarier. The mid-2000s were the heyday of little girls in dresses being scary. It was the law. At least, it was the law until Congress passed the Affordable Scare Act in 09. You kind of have to be a little more non-derivative nowadays if you're trying to create a genuinely scary game. I mean, let's not beat around the bush here. The bar has been raised significantly for horror games in the last decade. So of course the psychological horror game from 15 years ago with guns in slow motion isn't scary. Not much is scary after you watch someone try to perform forced top and bottom surgery on you in Outlast Whistleblower. So yeah, now that that's all laid bare for you, you can probably see why I'm getting whiplash from the slapdash pacing here. It's good FPS action that has aged well being cut together with psychological horror that has not aged well. Which is honestly a little bit of a statement on the fundamentals of horror as a media genre, just as a whole. Horror is hard to de-escalate. And that idea isn't just limited to video games. Once you've seen Get Out, how do you go back to paranormal activity or the happening expecting the same thrills? Well, you don't. That's how. Don't get me wrong, some horror experiences have absolutely stood the test of time, and are still scary years after the fact. Fear is just not one of those, by no fault of its own. Unless you use a time machine, but honestly, I was sick for weeks last time I fired mine up, so it's gonna be a while before I get back in. Oh yeah, you and I are gonna be good friends. It's nice and punchy too, you'll probably see me using the shotgun a lot throughout this video. Around here we have our first new enemy type since the soldiers. It's basically a bullet sponge, so the most effective strategy is to just dump all your explosives and powerful ammo on it until it flops over. Not very fun to fight, but at least it's something. Okay, I lied. I think the actual most effective strategy would be to lean around a corner and empty all your best guns and ammo into its face, but the leaning... ugh. The leaning makes me sick in this game. They tilt the camera way too much, so in order to not get sick for real in real life, I'm not going to be leaning that much in this game. Speaking of getting sick, get a load of this guy. Oh, damn, you're messed up. This guy tells us with his last dying breath that we can't let Pax and Fettel get to Alma, who I'm assuming is the little girl in red that we've seen stalking us. Why? She skeletonized that team of Delta Force members earlier, I'm sure she could handle it. After this, we get more excellent combat encounters, followed by a scenic helicopter ride to Armacam HQ, which is where Pax and Fettel is heading now, to look for Elmo. I mean, Almo. Alma. Sorry. Oh, god damn it, helicopter pilot! You dropped us right on top of them! This is a terrible LZ! Not even a tiny bit of recon, either. All the Special Forces members die immediately, and I'm on my own again. I guess all the hard training and careful preparation doesn't matter if the one calling the shots drops you right into the shit. Yeah, look at this scenery. This looks nice. I take back what I said about this being Philly earlier. We don't really build cities this close to mountain ranges on the East Coast. Wherever we are, it's definitely further out west. I guess we're at Armacam headquarters now. In case you forgot, Armacam is the private military corporation that made Pax and Fettel a telepathic commander. Honestly, their handling of the situation is piss poor. You should have certain fail-safes with something this volatile. Two people should have to turn a key at the same time or something. All they did was put him in a cell from what I can tell. Oh yeah, that'll keep him contained. The guy that can give commands to his soldiers telepathically definitely won't do any harm in a cell. I see no issues with this plan whatsoever. They should have had him in stasis or something, or at least had an entire telepathic chain of command. From what I can tell, the replica soldiers he commands don't act on free will, they're just following Fettel's orders. That's a good idea. Just have him follow orders and nothing else. Where have I heard this one before? This also raises a question, does Pax and Fettel make the soldiers say fuck when a nade lands near their feet? Like, what's the level of control here? 
Once we get inside Armacam, the game picks up again. We have great level layouts and visuals with plenty of good level design decisions and more slow motion fighting. Seriously, I can't get enough of shooting things in slow motion. It tickles a part of my brain that I didn't even know I had. On top of that, there's less Gary's Mod horror map stuff around here, which I actually prefer, but it confuses me because it seems like they don't really know how to combine the horror and the action, so they just forget about the horror for a while sometimes. I almost don't even care about that discrepancy because this level design is so good, it's got me hooked, even though the horror and story aspects of the game don't seem to be panning out. The close quarters office building environments tie in perfectly to the advanced AI that they have for the enemies. I think the level design is the most important part of what goes into making a good FPS. It doesn't matter if your weapons are fun to use, if your enemies are cool. If the levels don't flow well and feel right, none of that matters. In single player FPSs anyways, I don't know much about what makes multiplayer FPS level design good because I generally stay away from it. I used to actually think that I didn't like FPS games. Turns out, I just don't like multiplayer ones. Well, not multiplayer, but PvP multiplayer specifically. This is because most of the enjoyment I get out of video games comes from immersion. I like to play games to get lost in their worlds and forget about the horrors of reality for a while. All that is lost when you get sniped by XX Master of Shadows 99XX and someone calls your mom gay. That and the skill ceiling for most PvP shooters is so high. Seriously, I swear some of these COD kids are plugged into the game with a USB going to the back of their head or something. Man, I've been going off on a lot of tangents this video. I can't help it, I've been very thinky lately. Been doing a lot of thinking in my up here in my brain meat. Let me know if you guys like this style of video, or if you'd rather the commentary focus more on the game at hand. You won't hurt my feelings. Probably. Speaking of the game at hand, here we encounter invisible ninja enemies. For lots of people, invisible enemies are annoying and not fun to fight. For me, it depends on how the game handles invisible enemies. If they are just enemies, and they happen to be invisible, no thanks. Guessing where they are is not fun. If they're invisible enemies that you can still see in a way, then I'm on board for that, and that's exactly what we have here. They have a Metal Gear Solid-esque stealth camo system, but they do a good job of showing the environment react to them, even though they're hard to see. I really like this part. What the hell was that? Did he just throw a corpse at me through the window? Was it the invisible ninja's buddy, like he just got knocked unconscious when he hit the window with his head? Was he trying to scare me? Yeah, this is a good mix-up. Definitely more interesting than the enemies we've seen so far. Okay guys, I have to admit, I'm having trouble following the story here, but it's not another Enclave situation. The story is here, and I think they have some cool ideas. It's just that their delivery method is kinda shitty. I mentioned earlier that you get to listen to voicemails on phones to unravel the mystery of what's going on, but that's a problem because they rely on them way, way too heavily to tell the story. This is a game with slow motion FPS combat and a shitload of action movie particle effects and jump kicks and slide kicks and stuff. You kinda sort of really have to have more than an audio log to grab the player's attention away from the action and say, hey, snap out of game mode player, there's a story going on here. Not only that, but even if you do stop to listen to the voicemails, they're all vague information trails. You listen to them throughout the game, getting little exchanges between Armacam employees, slowly piecing the answers together bit by bit. This unraveling style of storytelling works well for games where the narrative is more focused, like a murder mystery game or one of those movie games like Until Dawn. But this is fear. I'm literally playing as the main character in a Zack Snyder film, and you want me to care about the research they're talking about in the voicemail? Hell no. Give me a damn cutscene or something. Anything other than these voicemails would have made the story far more engaging, except for, like, text blocks or something. That would have been worse. Fear is far from the only game guilty of this audio logs equals interesting story kind of thing, but, well, when in Rome. There's actually more about the story that bothers me, but that's gonna have to wait, because right now we're being introduced to Armacam employee Norton Mapes. Don't shoot! My name is Norton May. Wow, was there a fart sound effect mixed in there? Sure was! Anyways, Mapes is an asshole, in case you couldn't tell, but we both need something from each other. He says that if we disable the local security for him, he can patch us into the main network. You want my help, that's the price. I don't think they're gonna check in, man. Oh hey, it's his desk! 
Even though I was just complaining about the voicemail system, I like this one. It does a great job at illustrating toxic office culture in America. Norton, it's Ian Hyde. Look, um, Al's Wade stopped by my office this morning. I feel a little awkward saying this, but, uh, well, I really need you to tone down the innuendo around her. It's not that I personally give a rat's ass, but the last thing we need right now is a sexual harassment case drawing unwanted attention to the task force. No, don't side with him. You're part of the problem here, you know that? You are part of the pro- After that voicemail confirms my suspicions that Norton Mapes is a creep and a weirdo, we shoot some more soldiers and disable the local security for Mapes, but it doesn't matter because he goes back on his word and just runs away once he has what he wants. Eh, probably just went to groom some 14-year-olds over Discord. He's not our problem anymore. I'll tell you what is our problem, though. These damn hallucinations. Actually, this one hurts me, so I'm not even sure if I can call them hallucinations anymore. Paxson Fettel says that he was born from her, and that he wants to set her free. Whatever. This leads into my third and final reason on why fear isn't scary. Psychological horror games have always kind of fallen flat for me. Mostly because they rely too much on visions or hallucinations, or in other words, threats that aren't real. A monster that chases you around and can easily kill you and end your game has always been infinitely more scary to me than simply messing with the player's expectations of what's real and what isn't. And that's exactly what we're dealing with here. So there you have it. My big three reasons on why I don't find fear scary. I feel like I should also say that this is why I don't find it scary. I'm sure plenty of people do find it scary, but not me. But that's okay, I didn't come into this game expecting to be scared. I came in expecting things to shoot, and that's exactly what they give you, like 65% of the time. Although the game isn't scary, I do have to tip my hat to the sound designers because the ambient sounds and music really get under your skin. I would love to see these audio tracks repurposed for something with more of a horror core. Most of the music in this game is just ambient horror stuff. It does the job, but it's nothing you would listen to outside of playing the game. Unless you're like conducting a seance or something. Oh hey, it's Jin, the fear member from the beginning. She's just here to take pictures of the blood, I think, for her collection. There was a lot of anger in this room. What gave you that idea, Jin? Jesus Christ, look at all those bombs. I know I was just dumping on this game for its lackluster approach to storytelling, but I'll take exposition from a guy with 50 pounds of C4 strapped to his chest. He tells us that the soldiers were interrogating him for information on the whereabouts of Alice Wade, who is the daughter of Harlan Wade, who is the Armacan bigwig in charge of Project Origin, the project that turned Pax and Fettel into a telepathic commander. I don't think the game actually gives you all this information up to this point, but I figured I'd put it out there to make the story easier to follow for everyone watching. So why is Pax and Fettel doing this? He's clearly going after people that had something to do with Project Origin at some point, but why? Wouldn't he be pretty happy to have telepathic powers on par with some sort of eldritch horror? He should be thankful as far as I'm concerned. I would love to have a legion of telepathically controlled clones at my disposal. I could get a lot done. Honestly, using this telepathy for just combat is kind of a waste. I would have used it for something that benefits more people, like running soup kitchens or construction on a large scale. But I guess selling the technology to military powers is where all the money is. Man, I should have called in sick today. I don't think you get to call in sick to a hostage situation, dude. Ah, another scary part. Alma says that she knows who we are. I don't. I'm just some dude. I don't even have a name. They call the player character Point Man. I would assume they're doing that thing that you see in RPGs where they don't give the player character a name or they let you name them yourself so that the player can project themselves onto the character more easily. The reason that works in role-playing games is because the player has a lot of agency and can make choices that affect the flow of the game and the dialogue, which in turn makes you feel like you're part of the game. Not naming your main character in a game with a linear path does not work the same way. It just makes them less memorable to me. Speaking of Alma, I have a question for any Fear fans out there that might be overburdened with knowledge of the franchise. Is she just a hallucination, or is she teleporting around for real? Because here she leaves bloody footprints on the ground. That must mean that either the footprints are also a hallucination, or that she's zipping around like an energetic Minecraft admin. Let me know what you guys think, I'm genuinely curious. Around the corner we find out where they've been stashing all the bodies, Holy shit, it must reek in here. Yeah, in case it wasn't obvious yet, Armacam is fucked after this incident is all over. 
We have possibly hundreds of dead employees across Armacam, the docks, and the water treatment plant. On top of that, the replica soldiers have done probably hundreds of thousands in damages to property, including damages to military equipment like that helicopter from earlier. There is no legal recourse. At this point, it's just a question of if they have enough money to pay the fines and reparations, because we live in America, and if you have enough money, you can do whatever you want. A laptop lord dump later on tells us that Armacam is worth 8 billion. In 2025 money, honestly, that's not that much for a private military corporation. They must have a lot of their money stashed away in Swiss bank accounts or something. And as if they hadn't buried themselves deep enough, Armacam security forces shoot down a United States military aircraft in an attempt to assassinate the hostage from earlier. Well, um, attempt successful guys, he's dead, but what the fuck are they thinking? I can only assume they didn't want what the hostage knew to get out, but what information could he have that would make it worthwhile to shoot down a government aircraft like that, out in the open? While well, Armacam has easily secured their designation as a terrorist group with this series of blunders, ah well, all the more reason to give them a free sample of my 9mm chewing gum. It'll live rent-free in your head, but you probably won't be thinking about it. Also, we've been in Armacam headquarters for hours now. Why is it that we're only just now seeing Armacam security forces? Shouldn't they have been fighting the replicas downstairs? Yeah, they're probably pulling talent from the Uvalde Police Department. Well, 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 look who it is! Our old friend, Norton Mapes. You know what they say, Mapes. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, I put a bounding mine at your feet. This time he needs us to fix the elevators. Whatever, Mapes. I'm doing this for me, not for you. I feel like fear operatives should carry, like, zip ties or handcuffs or something, just for situations like this. I don't trust him being on his own, but he stinks, so I can't take him with me. Hey, rocket launcher, okay. It's good, as rocket launcher should be, but it does that weird thing where the projectiles seem to come from my eyeballs. Rocket vision, I guess. Look out, Cyclops. Oh, damn it, I guess he must have climbed over the couch. I didn't really think he was that nimble, he must have been motivated. He probably went to pre-order the new anime figure with squishable ass and tip. Found him! Shit! You know, running away from me is one thing, but springing automatic turrets on me is another. I could have died, Mapes. These turrets are no joke, too. They even suppress. Fuck me. They really don't want people finding out what they're working on up here if the security turrets are programmed to perform suppressing fire. Oh, and the music that plays when one of them activates is way too intense. Shit makes it sound like a xenomorph is popping out of the ceiling. Wheelchair accessible, nice. I have a lot of time to think while I'm waiting for the turrets to either lose interest in me or run out of ammo, and I find myself questioning exactly what I'm doing. All I'm doing throughout the entire game is chasing Pax and Fettel, and picking up clues as to what's going on along the way. Nothing really vital to the story of the game even happens to the player. Up to now, at least. It makes me feel like the story is happening, but we're just watching it all go down through like a chain link fence. It's really weird, I don't think I've ever played a game with a story that feels like this before. Luckily, the game starts throwing lots of new stuff at me at this point, which helps me keep playing. One of the new things being a mech enemy type. I have to admit, I didn't see this coming. They're a pretty solid addition to the combat. It takes a lot of careful maneuvering and slow motion to take these things down. Oh hey, the Type 7 particle weapon. This is one of the things I remember about this game from playing it a year or two ago. Let me show you why. You're a skeleton. You're a skeleton. You, skeleton. You look like you can make a good one. Flesh is only the barrier between the soul and the self. <laughs> this is the best gun in the game, and probably one of my favorite weapons in FPS games. How many other games have a gun that straight up skeletonizes the enemies? Probably not that many. Whew, okay. My issues with the story can take a backseat for now. If you let me turn people into skeletons, that's easily another few hours of enjoyment for me. Ooh, good catch. Don't tell me what to do. Yeah, call reinforcements. Tell them you guys can't kill one guy with a shotgun. I'm sure they'll be thrilled. Hey, it's Alice Wade. I forgot we were looking for her. Kind of just got distracted by making skeletons for a while, but whatever. She says that she has codes to the Project Origin Labs, which is probably where Harlan Wade is, and by extension, Pax and Fettel, too. The only problem is that she's afraid of flying, so she wants to take her car. You're afraid of flying, but you aren't afraid of bullets or being skeletonized? I mean, I'm not afraid of that, but you probably should be. I really like this elevator segment. The cheeky elevator music in between these shooting gallery style floors that we stop on is really fun. Well, it turns out Alice Wade is right because our helicopter gets shot down again right before we board it. 
She runs off and we follow. In case you're losing it in all the action, we're chasing Alice Wade to get to Harlan Wade to get to Paxton Fettel. The hell? Is that a UFO? Oh no, it's just some iPad kid flying his drone around. These enemies are fine, they add some verticality to the combat, but it just feels like I've seen it before. The enemies in this game are kind of dime a dozen. We got regular soldiers, heavy soldiers, heavy heavy soldiers, flying soldiers. The only enemy I think is sort of creative is the invisible soldiers, but even that has its limits. Ah well, we can skeletonize people, so it doesn't really matter. Don't come for me, I'm riding this high into the dirt. Holy shit, that is fucking nasty. Definitely one of the nastiest unflushed video game toilets I've seen. Not THE nastiest, mind you, because nothing is ever gonna top the toilet in Counter-Strike Source, because look at it. Jesus Christ. I want to know exactly how much time someone at Valve spent modeling this turd and piss-filled toilet in Maya or Blender or whatever they were using back then. Probably at least an hour just for the modeling work. After that comes the texture work and making the model ready to be dropped into the game. I think someone at Valve sat down, spent half their day or more just making the grossest toilet in gaming. Maybe more than one person. That's the kind of world we live in today. Anyway, Alice Wade drives off, we follow her in a brand new, not on fire, not shot down helicopter, oh god damn it. Are we cursed? Luckily we survive the crash and we find ourselves in a new environment, finally. It probably didn't feel like that long in the video, but I've been in that office building for hours. Most of this game takes place in that Armacam office building, and I think it really hurts the game's potential. They try, they really do, but there's only so much you can do if most of the game takes place in an office building. The area we crashed in conveniently happens to be the Auburn District, the place where the Project Origin Lab is supposed to be located. We have another weird walk around slowly and look at hallucinations sequence here, even though we've been shooting up soldiers non-stop to this point. Seriously, this game does not know what it wants to be. You can make a good action horror game, but the action and the horror have to mix together. Look at Metro. In that game, the action and the horror mix together well. Or hey, how about Condemned Criminal Origins? A game made by Monolith, the same studio that made this game. That doesn't happen here though. In Fear, the action and the horror both feel like very separate things. First we shoot a bunch of enemies in slow motion, then we have our psychological horror section with blown out fade to whites and motion blur where you don't use your guns. The shooter part and the horror part never cross streams. The frustrating part is that it's so easy to do that from a design perspective. The bare minimum would be have an enemy that's scary that you shoot at to defeat. Bam, there you go, shooter part and horror part have been mixed. Or hey, we've got this slow motion mechanic that looks great. Why don't we have a scary enemy that only exposes its weak point for half a second during an attack? You could have your player use their slow motion to get their shots off. We also have this half-baked limited flashlight mechanic. Well, how about we have enemies that are scary or tough, but can be held at bay or stunned using the flashlight? I guess what I'm saying is that this game has an identity crisis that hurts it in more ways than one. It goes for action, and it goes for horror, but it doesn't go for both at the same time. I think that if they melded the two together, this game could have been a lot better. But hey, there's still time. You never know when a game is going to surprise you, so let's keep on keeping on. After some fighting through the decrepit back streets of the Auburn District, we find the entrance to the Project Origin Lab. Look at this shit. I love Secret Underground Labs. It's a trope that's extremely overused in horror games, with Resident Evil being the most guilty by far, but goddamn do I love it. They wait until this last stretch of the game to dump lots of lore on you at once, so I'm gonna try to summarize it all. Norton Mapes is here for some reason. He's wiping hard drives for Armacam, although I'm not sure what they think that's gonna achieve at this point. We've already established that Armacam is finished after this no matter which way you slice it. He also gets shot by Harlan Wade, so that's good, saves us a bullet. While he's dying, he tells us that we have to blow this place sky high before Paxton can let Alma out of stasis. I think the small red dress Alma we've been seeing throughout the game was some sort of projection of herself, and that he's trying to free the physical Alma. Still not sure why, though. Revenge, probably. This laptop lore dump has some good info for us. It tells us that Alma is a powerful psychic, and that Harlan Wade made her give birth to two prototypes while she was in an induced coma, with Pax and Fettel being one of them. That's uncool. No wonder she's pissed off. But who's the second prototype? Well, Pax and Fettel finally spills the beans. You and I were born from the same mother. It's Point Man. Point Man and Pax and Fettel are the two Project Origin prototypes that Harlan Wade made Alma give birth to. Here's the thing though, that's 
not much of a reveal, because in the very beginning of the game, Paxton Fettel says, You were born here. Before we have visions of a hospital, and we hear the lamenting screams of a woman as a baby cries. Talk about layering it on thick! Jesus Christ! I don't think I've ever seen a game straight up spoil the ending twist by having foreshadowing this heavy-handed. I saw it coming from a mile away. How would I not? He told me I was born here in the first 10 minutes of the game. I just cut it out of the video to make it more exciting for people that haven't played this game before. We also learn that Harlan Wade is actually Alma's father, which makes this whole situation even more fucked up. Wait, wouldn't that also make Alice Wade my aunt? That's weird. Anyway, we pistol whip Pax and Fettel for spoiling the ending, which causes the replica soldiers to freeze in place. That's a nice touch, actually. I like that. We also get a good line from Harlan here. It is the way of men to make monsters. And it is the nature of monsters to destroy their makers. I don't know. I think it's the nature of men to run around in the forest forging for berries and shit in the nude, but you do you, I guess. Now that Alma is out of stasis, she liquefies her dad. I guess she has a Type 7 particle weapon. Alma being out of stasis also has an effect on us. The weird things that we've had frequent visions of throughout the game are now bleeding over into the real world and are coming after me. Okay, that's cool. Now we're cooking. Why did they wait until the last 10 minutes to have the shooting mixed with the- ah, whatever. This is a nice segment. We set the lab to explode in an attempt to keep Alma trapped down here, so naturally we have a Metroid-esque get-out-before-it-blows-up sequence. Ugh! Get out of my face, you damn ghouls! Mm. We do get out, but uh-oh, the explosion is a lot bigger than I expected. And it's still going. Holy shit, is that a nuke? Well, it's been a good run, guys, but I don't see a refrigerator anywhere around here, so I guess this is it. Ah! What? I don't care who you are, an explosion like that does not leave survivors at that distance. This is bullshit. Yeah, look at that mushroom. What was that sound? Oh, of course Alma survived. There wouldn't have been two sequels to this game if she hadn't. Well, that's the end of Fear, and I have never felt so conflicted on what to think of a game. There is two expansions that I have yet to go over, but we'll get to that. Allow me to summarize my thoughts on the base game and my expectations going into the expansions first. Fear is going for horror, and that's the problem, because it's not really a horror game at its core. At its core, it's a fast-paced, close-quarters shooter with an incredible sense of action and attention to detail that just does not quit. That's the part that's fantastic, seriously. I didn't expect a game with gameplay that was just focused on shooting enemies to keep my attention all the way through, but it delivered so well. The enemies are incredibly reactive to everything you do. From throwing a grenade at them to flanking them, they react to you in every possible way, which is a huge component of what makes the shooting in this game so addictive. That aspect of the game is aging extremely well, which is more than I can say for the horror. Not only is the horror in Fear extremely of its time, it's also not melded together with the awesome action core that we already have. The only point in the game where the horror is properly matched up with the gameplay is the few segments where you shoot those phantom thingies that charge at you. And even then, there's almost no feedback when you do shoot them, which makes me question why they even bothered in the first place. The only place the horror fits well is with the story, which unfortunately misses its mark, but not for a lack of good ideas. The story, in a nutshell, is this. Harlan Wade forces his daughter Alma to birth two children for experimental purposes because she has psychic powers. When one of these children, Paxton Fettel, is older, Alma influences him with her mind to have him set her free. For revenge, I assume, still, they didn't tell us exactly. All this is going down while the player, the other one of Alma's children, chases Paxton Fettel around town trying to put an end to it. Not only does this whole plot make it feel like the player is taking a back seat to what Paxton Fettel is doing the whole time, we also don't even know all of this until we either reach the final stretch of the game or we piece it together through the laptops and voicemails you can collect throughout the game. So they lock the player's sense of purpose behind this veil for no reason at all other than to be mysterious, I guess. If the player doesn't listen to the voicemails and laptop audio, which I guarantee is what most players are going to do, all that they know is that they're trying to catch Paxton Fettel so that his telepathically controlled soldiers will stop terrorizing the town. 
until the end when all the plot nuances are dumped on them all at once. And at that point, why would they care if they've been fed scraps for stories so far? The weak horror and weak story seals the deal for me. Fear is a first-person shooter first, and a horror game second. So what can we expect from the expansions? Well, going in, I'm hoping we can see them iterate on their ideas because they do have some good ones. I want to see if they have the FPS action mixed more with the horror. If they can realize that, then this game would be an absolute gem. I'm also hoping to see more of the city of Fairport. From the little bits that we did see, it looks like a nice setting. Unfortunately, we spent 75% of the game ascending an office building. The first expansion, Extraction Point, actually picks up directly after the end of the base game, after our helicopter crashes for the, what, fourth time? You don't see that too often these days, when a game's expansion picks up minutes after the end of the base game. And I do get one of the things I asked for almost immediately. The first few minutes sees us walking through the now-abandoned streets of Fairport. Look at this, this looks great. All the soldiers being frozen in place now the Fettle is dead is a good detail. I would have had them frozen in various poses, just like they seized up in the middle of doing whatever they were doing, but still, great presentation here. Speaking of Pax and Fettle, he's alive, somehow. Well, I guess I did pistol whip him instead of shooting him outright, so I guess that's on me. Sorry, everybody. I'll be more thorough next time. After we barely escape being pan-seared until golden brown by Alma, they start teasing a monster enemy. Oh, yes. Yes, Fear. More of that, please. And hey, check it out! More level variety! Oh, I'm getting excited. I am going to do a quick tour of these expansions like I did with the base game, but I'm just now realizing that I didn't take notes on when I encountered the new stuff, so I'm just going to cover all of the new additions to the gameplay now. Then we can go through the rest of the expansion. The first change you come across is the fact that you can now bust open doors with your melee attack like you're in some sort of hurry. Kinda cool. Would've been funny if the door could swing back around and do damage to you if you weren't careful. We now also have supply crates you can break open, in case this game wasn't Half-Life 2 enough for you. I think my personal favorite addition is the deployable turrets. You throw them out, they stick to any surface, and attack any enemies in range. This seems like a gadget an operator would have in Rainbow Six Siege. They're effective too, they aren't just a novelty. We also have two new guns, the Laser Carbine, which is effective but boring, and the freaking Chain Gun. My god, the chain gun. Listen to this. This thing feels so powerful. Too powerful, actually. I have to use it sparingly so that I don't develop a god complex. There's also a new, bigger mech enemy that looks a lot like EG-209 from Robocop. This one looks like it could handle stairs better, though. And finally, there's a new Soldier class, which looks exactly like a Fencer from Earth Defense Force. I know I make a lot of comparisons, but tell me I'm wrong. Look at that. That's a Fencer. 100%. Oh, and I might as well let you guys down gently now. The monster enemy that they teased us with earlier are basically reskins of the Invisible Soldiers, from what I can tell. They move the same way, only a little faster, and the tactics for fighting them remain the same. But they are trying. This is better than nothing in terms of making the horror fit better with the action. And that about covers it for new gameplay additions. Let's get on with the tour. Jin gets nabbed by replicas after they come back online, and when she escapes, she makes an insensitive remark about Alice Wade. How'd you get away? I'm not Alice Wade. Jesus, Jin, pump the brakes. She died hours ago, and you're already making jokes like that? And she was my aunt, or something. For a bit, we accompany Douglas, one of the surviving members of Delta Team. We go through some industrial area trying to link up with Jin or get to our extraction point. I don't remember, honestly. I'm going to apologize on behalf of Douglas here to anyone watching this in the year 2445, since he likes to call the clone soldiers test tube motherfuckers. Which is just borderline unacceptable and offensive to clones, so yeah, sorry about that. He gets his comeuppance, though. Yeah, maybe you should have called in sick today. This crashed airliner looks great. It reminds me of that level in Left 4 Dead. And I can't explain why, but I really like this subway section. There's something about the shape of the tunnels and the lighting direction that just really brings it together. It feels like an actual subway terminal. Like, I feel like I could encounter a mugger or a drunk guy that smells like piss at any moment. It's here that we get what might be the one shred of plot development in the entire expansion. 
A small red dress Alma kills some soldiers for me, helping me out in a tough situation. I like that. That makes the fact that she didn't turn us into goo during the base game, even though we saw her dozens of times, make more sense. Maybe she was leading me to Fettel? I think if that's the case, then Little Alma is a projection of Big Alma's innocent former self, before all the messed up stuff happened to her. Alma's a victim, and I feel bad for her. What? Wh the hell? Mape survived not only getting shot in the chest point blank, but also survived the Titanic explosion? That is... laughable. I think the devs just put him here because they thought it was funny. It kind of is, actually. Hmm. Hmm. Here they make it seem like you have a choice of which portal to go through to either go to the extraction point or save Jin, but all the portals except for one of them teleport you back to the beginning of the sequence, so I have to wonder what the point of that was. Oh ho ho ho! Looks like that's what you get, Jin. Now you're like Alice Wade, you insensitive bitch! At the final stretch of the expansion, Small Alma, who I now realize I could have been calling Smallma this whole time, which would have been hilarious and cool, has a Steven Spielberg moment with Corpse Alma, which I think is a good thing because the music that plays afterwards is triumphant and happy sounding? Maybe? We get a nice scenic rooftop battle during sunrise as we hold out until the helicopter arrives. Rides here, let's go! <sighs> Why did I ever expect otherwise? That's five helicopters now. And that's the end of Fear Extraction Point. It's really good overall. They still don't flesh out the story much, but at least they stopped pretending they were with the voicemails and stuff. And some of the scares are pretty good compared to the base game. If you're not desensitized like me, you're gonna have a better time with the scary stuff here. I think Extraction Point improves on what's already good about the base game, but it fails to improve on the stuff that really needed improving. The new stuff doesn't blow me away or anything, I've definitely played better expansions in my time, but damn. If you liked pumping baddies full of lead in the base game like I did, you should play this expansion too. On to the second and final expansion for Fear. Perse- Perseus? Pursuus? Perseus. Perseus? Perseus. Perseus Mandate. Oh, multiplayer. Oh, Game Spy. Yeah, never mind. Every time I see the GameSpy logo in an older title, it feels like I'm looking at a kid that doesn't know that their parents are dead yet. Like, GameSpy went offline in 2013, but here the logo is, just immortalized in a bunch of now-defunct multiplayer modes. Unlike Extraction Point, this expansion picks up around the halfway point of the base game story mode, and we play as yet another unnamed fear operative. This time we go in with Reigns and Chen, and our job is to investigate a cloning facility that produces the replica soldiers. Eventually, we learn that a mercenary group called the Nightcrawlers is after a sample of Alma's DNA, so we have to prevent that from falling into the wrong hands. The mercs are led by this white-collar worker in a bulletproof vest. That's Delta Force. What the hell are they doing here? The voice actor for Reigns probably sounds very familiar to you. It's because it's Steve Bloom, who has probably one of the most impressive resumes in the voice acting world. Like, look at that. 839 credits on IMDb. Holy shit. Spike Spiegel, Tank Dempsey, and freaking Wolverine, the character that I was named after in real life. And I know, before you hit me with the, mm, but Logan isn't even his real name. I know. I know his name is James Howlett, but everyone calls him Logan. He even calls himself Logan. Even after learning his real name is James, for Christ's sake. So miss me with that shit. Sorry, I've been holding on to that one for a while. <laughs> Look, they almost learned their lesson with the flashlight. They give you an increased battery life and a faster recharge, but the scuffed mechanic is still here. This reeks of compromise. I'll bet someone smart on the design team did learn their lesson and wanted to have the flashlight be unlimited, but someone else more stubborn disagreed with that, so we're left with this. I talked about the flashlight briefly earlier, but let's talk about why designers might think they want to limit the player's flashlight. If your flashlight is a weapon of some kind, like in Dying Light, then limiting it makes sense. You don't want your weapon to be unbalanced. Maybe if your flashlight can reveal stuff that you couldn't see otherwise, like in Resident Evil Revelations 2, you might want to have the batteries be a resource of some kind. But we don't have any of these in fear. Here, the flashlight serves its normal, real-life purpose. To see. So why limit the player's ability to see? Because it's scary? I mean... It can be if it goes out at the right time, but most of the time it's just annoying. Anyway, I already did this rant, so I won't be a broken record here, but there you have it. 
There is no reason for the limited flashlight other than other games do it too, which is a bullshit reason. Okay, actually, I thought of another reason that might actually be legit. You might want to limit your player's flashlight so that the more artistic aspects of the lighting design is preserved. But there are better ways of doing that than just turning the flashlight off when the battery reaches zero. That's caveman logic. You can make the flashlight more narrow, just disable it in areas where it isn't needed, or you could just have lighting direction that makes it so the player doesn't need the flashlight. Okay, enough flashlight talk. Let's get back to the game. The additions we got in Extraction Point are all present, along with some new ones. Let's start with the weapons. A grenade launcher that will get you killed if you're not careful enough, an advanced rifle that has a light amplifying scope, and a lightning arc that somehow manages to be the most boring weapon in the game, despite being called a freaking lightning arc. At least this still looks cool in slow motion. The new enemies are far more interesting than the weapons. Here we finally have some solid monsters, of the floor variety. They grab you and drag you down until you shoot them enough to make them let go. Okay, Fear. Okay, you got me. This is a good way to bring the action and the horror together. Might be too little too late, but I'll take what I can get. We also get acrobatic soldiers that, on top of being just as reactive as the replica soldiers, can flip around like their hearts will stop if they stand still for longer than a minute. These are good enemies, and they're the most fun to fight so far. Their speed necessitates the use of the slow motion, and they really push you. Definitely the best enemy in the game, or at least they're my personal favorite. Having them jump around also makes the levels more vertical, naturally, so it only elevates the already amazing level design we had before. What does that mean, Chen? What are you, Jeffrey Dahmer? Gonna take a Polaroid? The cloning facility looks kind of bare bones. It reminds me of Doom 3 a bit. It doesn't make an impression on me. Neither do all these wide open areas. Some of them work, like this train yard, but this game's combat does not do well at longer ranges. It's just not built around that. Fortunately though, there's like one or two open areas with enemies in them, so I can give them a pass on that. This part on the street I like. Around here in the expansion is when Point Man offs Paxton Fettel in the Origin facility, so all the replicas freeze in place. This guy was being lined up to be executed by a firing squad, and the replicas froze just in time for him not to be shot. Look at him, he's traumatized, as he should be. It does make me question why this is the only civilian we've seen in either of the expansions. Well, there was that one guy I didn't bring up before, but still, just two? Where is everybody? And here we are at the end. We have Alma's DNA sample, the guy that hired the mercenaries got crushed by a truck, and our ride is here. What do you think, guys? Do you think this unnamed expansion protagonist is going to escape Fairpoint via helicopter? Uh, actually, yes. To my surprise, we do escape without being shot down. I am shocked that we survived. That's the biggest plot twist yet. And there we have it. Fear, Perseus Mandate. Not as good as Extraction Point, but the acrobatic Nightcrawler enemies and the non-stop fantastic level design and FPS action make it worth playing if you like the rest of Fear. They bring the horror and the action together a tiny bit more with the floor monsters, but for the most part, it's more the same on that front. I would go as far as saying that this is the least scary content in this game. I can't remember a single spook that made an impression on me in Perseus Mandate. Okay, Chen's death scene was pretty cool, but that's it. Oh, a post credit scene! What do we have? Oh, snap! They got Paxton Fettel's DNA! That's a good sequel setup. I think now's a good time to mention that these expansions are both non-canon, as stated by Monolith themselves. I guess Monolith just specializes in making non-canon games, since they also made the Middle Earth games, which are also non-canon, even though there isn't anything in them that would break the already existing Lord of the Rings canon. Well, that I know of. I still haven't seen Rings of Power since everyone says that it's not that great. And while we're talking about it, I have to come clean, guys. There's a reason this video didn't come out like two to three weeks before it did. I got addicted to Middle-Earth Shadow of War. Seriously, I played the beans out of this game for like two weeks, barely putting any time into writing during that time. What can I say? I didn't know that hacking up orcs and pitting them against each other would bring me so much happiness going into it, but here we are. So with that final unrelated tangent out of the way, let's wrap up. Fear as a whole is a game largely remembered for its gameplay, and rightfully so. 
Fear's gameplay stands the test of time. It's still fun to play to this day. And all it had going for it was great action, slow motion, and fantastic attention to detail in terms of visual effects and ambient audio. Since those few aspects are so good, that's really all it needs. The horror aspect and the story both take a minor role compared to the gameplay. Though I will say, my opinions on the game's horror being bad are just that, my opinion. This is coming from someone who has played horror games since before they learned their ABCs, so you should take the fact that I don't think fear is scary with a grain of salt. It could very well be scary, but I would have no idea. Even though the game is constantly giving itself whiplash between the shooter segments and the psychological horror segments that are divided with a hard line, I think it's worth playing in spite of that because the actual game is so good. So with that in mind, let's answer the burning question. Should you play this game? Well, if you're like me and you just want to shoot things and be shot at by things for hours on end in extremely well-designed levels, then by all means, you should play Fear. It's a great game for when you just want to check out and shoot bad guys with some minor interruptions. You should not play this game if a game's story is a huge reason for you to play it, for two reasons. One, Fear's story is very piecemeal and not presented in an engaging way. And two, you just watched this video, which means that all the twists have been ruined for you, and they're a big component of the story. Alright, that's all I have to say for this one. Take care, and don't forget to call your mother. Okay, now that all the common rabble have clicked off the video at this point, it's time for the super secret news segment. Welcome! First, I'd like to take some time to talk about Enclave, the subject of my last video, because some viewers have brought some interesting information to light that actually makes a lot of sense in retrospect. According to Lupert Everett, the adware for Raven's Cry that I mentioned was thanks to Topware, who acquired the Enclave IP at some point and thought it would be a good idea to put adware in a 15-year-old RPG for their sorry excuse of a pirate game. Doesn't make it any better, but hey, at least it wasn't the original devs' idea. They've been spared from my wrath. But not for much longer, because, well... Do you remember in the very beginning of the Enclave review, I mentioned the commercial pitch of the game? Play your way, side with good or evil and all that, or whatever? Well, I learned after finishing the video that that's all complete bullshit. You have to finish the light campaign to even access the dark campaign. Choose your side, my ass, Enclave. So that invalidates what I said about recommending that new players play the Dark campaign first, since they can't. Also, I can't find the comment now, maybe the user deleted it, but someone said that the reason some of the level design was so weird was because Enclave was originally going to be a multiplayer deathmatch game, and that the levels were repurposed for a single-player experience later on in the development process. Well, that makes a little bit of sense, but it wasn't actually the level design itself that I had a problem with, more like the art direction, so they must have done a good job repurposing the levels. Alright, for my final piece of news, I'd like to talk about the future of the channel. Let's address the elephant in the room. Yes, this video took a long time for me to make. I don't have a good excuse, other than I have to pay rent somehow. Trust me, I would love to have more time to make videos like this, but the reality is that they actually take a long-ass time to make. Which is something I've been learning throughout the process of making these videos for you. So, what I want you to take away from this is that I cannot promise regular videos. Not at this point in time, anyway. What I can promise you is that I will continue to focus on a policy of quality over quantity. I would rather have videos take months to make and bring more joy to everybody than shit out a low-effort video every two weeks or something. So, thank you all for watching and being patient with me. Like, seriously, thank you for watching. 1600 views and counting on a first video on a channel that started with zero subscribers is kind of unheard of, so thanks. Oh, and I left a hint somewhere in this video as to what the next review game is going to be. Can you find it? Okay, bye.
Want some cheesy poos? Get your own.